But taken from this passage, taken from the theme that we've adopted as a church uh, for this anniversary year, anchored in advancing, that's what I've entitled my message this morning, and that's really what I want to focus our attention upon. Right, what do we mean by that, anchored in advancing? What does the scriptures have to say to us about how that would be accomplished and why that is necessary and what dangers perhaps lie in wait of us if we're not careful and conscientious about these things? So I want to encourage us all this morning. I trust we will find blessing from God's word as we look at this theme this morning, anchored and advancing out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's go to the Lord and ask his, his blessing on our time in his word. Father, we ask that you would bless now in these moments of the service where we turn our attention to your word. We've read this text before. And now we will spend some time considering it in its context and trying to understand what the Apostle Paul was trying to teach this particular local church in Corinth and what he has for us today as well as another local church, looking back upon these texts and trying to derive truth from them that will keep and sustain us as a local church. We're excited about this day and what it represents for us as a church. We're thankful for what you have done in this church already. And we look forward to what you can and, I believe, want to do with us in the future. But I do believe this passage reminds us that it is not just a given that these things would occur, that there are responsibilities on our part that we must take seriously. And I, I pray this morning that your spirit would enable us to see those things from your word as we consider this text. And we just trust that you will take it and use it in our lives as you see fit. Certainly, in my mind, I have things I think that perhaps this could accomplish in my life or in others, but I know that your spirit has the, the unbelievable ability to take a passage of Scripture and use it in ways in individuals' lives that I could never dream or imagine. I've seen you do it in my life in that way. And so there are many needs here in this congregation this morning. I trust that in some form or fashion, your spirit will take the word today and meet those needs. And we'll give you praise in advance for how you will do this, and it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Prior to uh, serving as the pastor here at Abundant Life Baptist Church, I was privileged to pastor in a church in Maine, central Maine, for uh, 14 years, I guess it was. I'm losing track of time. I think it was 14 years. And when I came to that church in December of 2001, I came to a church that had just celebrated four years prior to that their 175th church anniversary. And during my time there as their pastor, I was fortunate enough to be able to celebrate that church's 180th and 190th uh, church anniversary as a local church. And I'm hopeful if the Lord tarries and he would grant me that opportunity and they'd be willing to let me come back in 2022, I'd like to take a trip to Maine and be able to celebrate with that church its 200th anniversary as one of God's local churches. Now, obviously, compared to my previous pastor in Maine, our church's 20th anniversary can almost seem small and perhaps somewhat insignificant. But I would remind us this morning that it is not in any shape, form, or fashion. For the things that enable this church to begin and continue now for 20 years are the very same things that caused the church I pastored in Maine to begin and continue for 197 years. But this really, I think, thought raises a question in our minds, what is a church? There are churches throughout the world which would make the history of the church I pastored in Maine pale by comparison. There are churches that have histories dating back many hundreds of years. And I don't know, but perhaps there are some churches that have a history dating back for a thousand years or more. But does that make them a church? I was sitting in my office the other day, and I Googled oldest churches just to see what might happen. And some of the sites that came up when I put in that Google search were <clears throat> smart enough to distinguish the fact that we need to be careful when we say oldest churches because some people might be thinking how old of a building, a church building they were in, or how old of a church congregation. I would hope all of us here this morning understand the fact that although we often call our church building the church, it really isn't the church. The membership, the, the humans that make up this church, we are the church. This is just the building that our church happens to use. But even when we make that distinction, <clears throat> and we only seek <clears throat> excuse me, to count those congregations which have continued in existence for a significant period of time, I think we do have to be honest to ask this question. Are those churches, in a New Testament sense, a church? 
There can be groups which chartered as a church and which still meet today and declare themselves to be a church, perhaps for many hundreds of years, perhaps in some cases for a thousand years or more. But the question is, do they actually meet the biblical requirements <laughs> to be classified as a New Testament church? Now, I'm not going to take the time this morning and attempt to answer the question, what makes a New Testament church? I did a series on this last year at the beginning of the year, and we spent several weeks in the book of Acts looking at that birthing of the first church there on Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem. And we looked at what the scriptures list there, and we saw in those, those listings the elements of what I believe the scriptures are informing us make up a true New Testament church. This morning, I want to focus our attention much more narrowly. How do we, the current congregation of Abundant Life Baptist Church, assure that we will continue to remain a viable New Testament church. And the answer, I believe, we'll see this morning lies in the theme that I have chosen for this anniversary year and the theme that we are going to take for this morning's message, and that's the sermon titled, To Be Anchored and Advancing. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you've got your Bibles there, and I would encourage you to stay there with me, I want to read the, the main portion that I'm going to use as our text this morning, and that's found in verses 10 through 17. Let me read those verses again. Follow along with me in your Bibles, where Paul says this, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And I think we would have to be honest here if we look at the context in this sense, although the individual Christian's body is also declared to be the temple of the Lord in, in this very book of 1 Corinthians. In this context, he's speaking of the corporate element. So the church congregation itself is being declared the temple of the Lord here. So he says, know ye not that ye, in this case, the Corinthian church, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, so in this case the church of God, he himself shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now our text this morning is very important to me. <laughs> For while it is being written to a church congregation, in this case the church in Corinth, this section that we're going to look at this morning specifically appears to be aimed at those who were either serving as the Corinthian church's elders at that time, or perhaps some that were in the church that were vying to have that position of being the elder, or maybe the term we would use today is pastor. These specific verses, verses 10 through 17, give Paul's strong declaration. It's a warning against the dangers of failing to understand the foundational truth of the church, and therefore taking a church in a direction which would never be able to withstand the coming judgment of Jesus upon that work. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of our message this morning, but before we can do that and understand it purposefully, we do need to spend a few moments going back and looking at this letter up until this point and putting this into context. So if you would turn back with me to chapter 1, let's just read a few verses. I'll say a few things about some of these verses as we go along, hopefully getting us up to speed, getting us thinking along Paul's way of thinking so we can properly understand the text this morning that is the message. First thing I would say this, the church at Corinth was a church, and by that I mean a New Testament uh, church. And look at verses 1 through 9. We certainly see that declared here. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, 
that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord." You know, while the, Paul, the Apostle Paul has much in this letter, and if you've read Corinthians recently or just have a good memory of when you've read it in the past, you know he has a lot to take this church to task over. But he never wavers in his belief and his declaration that this Corinthian church, in spite of all of its struggles, is truly a church of Jesus Christ. And I think this is an important element for us to keep in mind, for it reminds us that even the true churches of Jesus Christ can get themselves into trouble if they lose sight of God's purposes for their church. So I want us to keep in mind, when we think of Paul's state teaching here, he's speaking to a legitimate church, one who is made up of born-again believers in Jesus Christ, who are one of God's special churches. We also learn, though, as we read on, that this church at Corinth was a divided church. Let's look at verses 10 through 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me, you, unto, unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You know why Paul was used of the Lord to establish this congregation, this church here in Corinth, he was not allowed to stay there forever. So upon his departure from Corinth, obviously others had to assume the leadership roles, the eldership roles, to be the pastors, if you will, within this church. The testimony of Scripture here would lead us to understand that Apollos was at least one of the pastors there, probably the main pastor for a period of time in Corinth. But it seems likely by the time Paul is writing this letter that Apollos also has left and gone on somewhere else, and others were in his place. Paul says, I've received words from some family within the church, the house of Chloe, that the church is divided. And they're dividing into several groups, camps, if you will. He said there are people that say we're of the Paul camp. There are others that say we are of the Apollos camp. There are others that even said we're of the Cephas, the Peter camp. Apparently, I don't, we don't know that Peter ever came to Corinth. He may have, but perhaps they had heard Peter preach in some other place and now relocated to Corinth. And so they were saying, well, well, you think you're somebody. I'm somebody because I got to hear Peter preach, and he was my pastor for a period of time. And then you have the really spiritual ones that say, we're of the Jesus camp, right? And this church was divided over human personalities. And so Paul is writing, at least in part, to correct this problem. There's a church that's divided. It's divided around personalities, around people. And Paul's writing to put that into perspective and to try to stop it before it disintegrates into something even more dangerous within the church. I think we also learn, as we read this Corinthian letter, that the church apparently was struggling under the stigma of the cross. Let's go back to chapter 1 and let's pick up in verse 18. Follow along and see what Paul says here. He says, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, 
and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. It would seem obvious that the divisions which had occurred over the personalities of the leaders arose at least in part based upon the prestige these individuals placed upon these particular human leaders. Paul, however, would, allow, would make the congregation understand that these leaders are not responsible for their salvation. Paul reminds them that their salvation was the result of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. And he's informing them that the cross of Jesus Christ will always carry a stigma. In fact, it is this very stigma which often makes the preaching of the cross so reprehensible to those that hear it, whether they be Jews or Gentiles alike. Have we not seen it? People love to talk about spiritual things. They love to talk about religious things. They love to talk about how they could be assured that they would have some glorious eternity where they would never suffer and have the blessings of heaven all their life. But the moment you turn the conversation from all of these wonderful things that they would all like to aspire to and turn the conversation to the fact that in order for that to happen... God had to become flesh. He had to take upon his body the sins of the world, my sins and your sins. He had to suffer upon the cross of Calvary as the payment for those sins. And it is only through that crucifixion and his ultimate resurrection that we have any hope of eternal life. How many people, when they hear that message, turn aside in disgust? A cross, death, blood, suffering, evil, I refuse to admit that. I refuse to accept that. Because in doing so, that makes me a sinner. It makes me somebody who has failed to glorify God. It makes me somebody who deserves hell. I refuse to acknowledge that. I refuse to accept that salvation can only come through the death of one upon the cross of Calvary. And so they were looking to turn aside from the stigma of the cross. And they were looking to find their affiliation and their success and their their basis upon the, the wisdom and the knowledge of these great teachers that they were following. Paul is reminding these Corinthians that if they are saved, they need to give glory to God because God is the one that broke down this stigma in their lives. These earthly leaders they were enamored with hadn't done this. They were not responsible for their salvation. God had done this. He had saved them through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, Paul says, let no flesh glory in his presence. Whether it be me glorying or whether it be some guru spiritual leader I follow, he will not find glory in the presence of God. The only one that's going to find glory for our salvation is God himself and the person of Jesus Christ. That's Paul's testimony. This church at Corinth has the ability, Paul says, to understand these things. And they can do this because they have the Spirit of God living in them. Look at chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. And you know what, folks? If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, he could have. He had the Ph.D. of his day. He was a Pharisee. He was learned. He had studied at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest Jewish teachers and professors of the day. He had all of the credentials. And yet Paul says, when I came to preach to you, I never talked about me or my education or my background or anything that I was. He said, I only had one message for you. He says in verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but it would stand in the power of God. But then he says this, how be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, which the, ho- by, which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual 
But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What an amazing reality that Paul lets these Corinthians know. And us by default as we read this passage. The very granting of God's Holy Spirit to us is giving us the ability, because now God lives within us, to have a renewed mind and understanding that can actually comprehend the spiritual teachings of God. I can actually know the mind of Christ. That we can actually understand what God himself is saying to us and what his expectations are for our lives. Paul says to the Corinthians, in spite of all their problems, they have this ability because the Spirit of God lives in their very body. And corporately speaking, we could say the Spirit of God dwells within the temple of their local church. This is obviously what makes the actions of these Corinthian Christians such a travesty. They should know better than to do these things because the Spirit of God lives in them. Paul has to go on and say at the beginning of chapter 3 that unfortunately these Christians were carnal. Look what he says in verses 1 through 9. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes of Christ. And we don't have time to develop this, but I would just encourage you. I know there are places in the scripture, Romans uh, chapter, I think it's 8 being one of those that tells us if you, don't have, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you are not one of His. So what he's speaking of here is not the sense of whether you have the Spirit or not. If you don't have the Spirit, you're not a Christian. In this case, he's saying, I can't speak unto you as spiritual, but as an carnal. He is obviously talking about Christians. He's already stated that. So they have the Spirit, but they're obviously not walking in that Spirit. They're not allowing the Spirit to have His way. They're living carnal-minded lives rather than allowing the Spirit to have His way. That's why he has to say these things. Verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. You know, whereas these Christians have the glorious spirit of God within them, ready to enable them to understand the wonderful truths of God and his purposes concerning them, they were failing miserably in this area because they were refusing to submit themselves to the Spirit's leadership and teaching, and they rather were living as carnal babes. They, though saved, were thinking and acting like the unsaved around them. They were worshiping men. They were failing to understand God's glorious purposes concerning them. And so Paul asked this church, he asked them this question, Are you so carnal that you can't understand that I, speaking of himself, the Apostle Paul, or Apollos, we're simply ministers. That word minister is where we get our Greek word deacon from. Diakonoi, table servant. Do you not understand that we're just bus boys? <laughs> That's all we are. We're just servants of God through whom you heard the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you not understand that whether you heard these truths from me, the Apostle Paul, or Apollos, that neither I or Apollos are anything? It's God that gives the increase. And he asked them, do you not understand, Corinthian Christians, that I, Paul, and Apollos are laborers together with God? Again, we're just simply servants that are doing the will of God, and his will was that we would come and minister unto you and, and help you to come into the, the glorious family of God. But he says this at the end of that verse about them. In verse 9, he says, but ye, you're God's husbandry. You're his harvest field. And ye, you are his glorious building. You are the beautiful temple that God is erecting. It is here that Paul seemingly shifts his focus to those who are presently serving as the Corinthian spiritual leaders and perhaps aiming at some who are desirous to be spiritual leaders in Corinth. And he gives them the most solemn warning and instruction. And this is where I want to spend these remaining moments of this message. And it's where I hope God will help us to see what a vital truth there is for any church which wishes to remain a viable church for Jesus Christ until the time that he returns. I have three basic points I want to bring out of the remainder of our text I hope God will help us to understand it and apply it in our own individual lives and our corporate life as one of his local churches. Number one, I would say this. A true church must be anchored. A true church must be anchored. Let's go to verse 10 and 11 of our text. 
According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul begins by saying this. I was a wise master builder. This is not self-exaltation. <laughs> what he's basically saying is, God enabled me to enter into his wise plan. And as a wise master builder, by God's grace, he says, I have been allowed to lay the foundation for your church here in Corinth. And he goes on to inform them what the foundation is that he laid. He said, the foundation I laid here is Jesus Christ. Now, while Paul is using a building metaphor, we need to understand that Paul is not speaking again about the church building here. He's speaking about the church congregation. The fact that there were Christians existing in the city of Corinth, Paul is informing them, was because Paul had come to Corinth as a minister of Jesus Christ and had preached Jesus Christ and him crucified unto them. And Paul clearly states that Jesus is the only foundation that any church can ever be built upon. Now, having said that, let us also acknowledge that there are a lot of churches that are not built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Most of you are aware the word that's translated church in our English Bible is a Greek word, word ekklesia, and it simply means a called out assembly. And it's used even in our Bibles to describe things other than what we would think of as a New Testament church. It could be any group of people that are called out for any assembly. In Greek culture, they would have called that group an ekklesia. So a group could gather around any number of individuals, ideas, or purposes. And unfortunately, there are many churches in our world today, even churches who would describe themselves by their own definition as a New Testament church, we in actuality are not. And they're not because they are not in existence as the result of the preaching and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why they're not. You know, a group of people don't just decide one day to get together and say, we're going to be a church. That doesn't work. You're a church because Jesus Christ has changed you. He's saved you from your sins. He's given you new life in him. He's made you a new creature. And he brings you into fellowship with others that he has saved, and therefore you then, by his grace and power, become a church. A church is not a church because they meet in a building that says church on the sign on the front door. A church is not a church because they just claim to be a church, even because they claim to be a Christian church. A church is a church because their existence is the result of being made new creatures in Christ. They are a church because the glorious gospel of Jesus was proclaimed unto them and they have been saved from their sins and they are now followers of Jesus Christ. You know, this is why Paul said earlier to the Corinthians, he says, when I came to preach to you guys, I didn't say anything in your presence than what I was determined to tell you, that you need to know about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul was a wise master builder because he only had one message to proclaim Jesus and him crucified or maybe we could say it this way you must be saved <laughs> and you can only be saved by repenting of your sin and placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal savior folks can I challenge us this morning as abundant life Baptist church we can only be we can call ourselves whatever we want but in God's estimation, we can only be considered a legitimate New Testament church as long as our foundation remains Jesus Christ. And this is the case because the only way a New Testament church can ever exist is if Jesus himself gives it life. And his salvation has made them his. And he has drawn them together around his purposes to accomplish his will. So Abundant Life Baptist Church must remain anchored. This is why our theme and our motto is this, anchored. We must remain firmly founded upon Jesus Christ. If we ever cease to be firmly anchored to the foundation of Jesus Christ, at that particular point, we cease to be a New Testament church. And unfortunately, there are many congregations over the centuries who, though perhaps in some cases they started well, they slowly turned away from the foundation of Jesus Christ. And when they did, regardless of what they might still call themselves, or regardless of what others around the world might still classify them to be, they are not a New Testament church. For all New Testament churches have as their one and sole and only foundation the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I would add to that this thought. Not only must a true church be anchored, a true church must be advancing. 
Again, go back to verse 10. Paul writes, according to the grace God which has given me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall de reveal, declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Obviously, in our motto, we chose the word advancing because of its consonants. It went along with anchored. But I hope we all understand by the word advancing, we mean within the context, the building that goes on. The building, the edifying, the building up upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Can we say it this way? While the foundation is in one sense everything, for without Jesus Christ the foundation we have nothing, there is a sense in which the foundation only exists for the building which will eventually rest upon it. In other words, while Jesus is everything to the church, he himself is not the church. The church is for him. Therefore, the church is, in this case, as Paul's presenting it here, it is to be built up upon him. Paul acknowledges, and I think even is encouraged by the fact that after he laid the foundation at the church in Corinth, others would and did build upon that foundation. Paul, in some ways, actually, when you think about his ministry, was, was involved in both of these areas. As an evangelist, maybe we would think of the term missionary, as a church planter, Paul, when he went into a community that had not previously been evangelized, he preached only one message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. He sought to lay the foundation of Jesus Christ. So he came preaching the glorious gospel for the purpose of hoping to see people saved and added to the family of God. But as a pastor, and Paul does describe himself as an elder in different places, as an apostle, Paul also went on to edify or attempt to build up these churches that had been established. This very epistle is one of his efforts in doing so. Why does he write this letter back to Corinth? He's writing it back as a shepherd, as a pastor, saying, okay, wait a minute, church, you, you've been established here, but you're, 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 you're wavering, you're getting off the line of what you're supposed to do. So as their shepherd, as their elder, as their pastor, as their apostle, Paul's writing them this corrective to help them to see the error of their ways and so that they can get back on track and be all that God intended them to be. We need to understand that while the preaching of Jesus Christ and Him crucified is vital to the foundation and the establishment of a church, there is also a sense in which this is only the beginning. There is now the critical work of seeing the church built up in their most holy faith. This, Paul acknowledges, is the work of those who would follow the church planter. And this is good, and it's holy work as well. For the edifice which is the church, and by edifice I'm still referencing people, not a building, must be continually being built until Jesus Christ returns. If you keep your finger here, would you turn over to Ephesians 4? Consider how Paul writes it there real quickly. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. We, if you were in our Sunday school class this morning, we, we touched on these verses in our Sunday school class. But I want to read them again here. Won't read it, but in verses 7 through 10, Paul talks about how Jesus Christ, after he went into heaven, gave gifts unto the church. And now he describes what these particular gifts are. In this case, he's speaking of office gifts, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, that would be the maturing of them, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. That was the Corinthians' problem, right? He described them as babes. They were like children. They were tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But Paul says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, that the church may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted to that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This is the building work, if you will. 
And Paul clearly tells the Ephesians, this is one of the gifts of God too. Yes, the, the missionary, the church planner is God's great gift. He sends to those people to share the gospel. That's why when we send out missionaries, we're sending them to the places where the gospel has not yet been heard. Go and preach the gospel to all people that they might hear what Jesus has done for them, that they might be saved. Well, if they do get saved, and we hope many will get saved, a church is established. Many times the missionary understands his work here is now done. He goes up and moves to another community where the gospel is not yet preached, and he begins all over again preaching the gospel. Well, what's to happen with these Christians that got saved in the church that's been established? God brings in people, now these elders, these pastors, who will be used of him to help build up that church in their most holy faith. This is a good and holy work. And it's something that helps the church to go through. It's helping the church, which has been established on Jesus Christ, become all that Jesus saved her and intended her to be. So for a church to be anchored but to not be advancing is in, any, in many ways no church at all. I grew up in many times through my Christian experience where Sunday after 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 Sunday the only message we ever heard was a declaration of the gospel. And people would say, what's wrong with that? Don't we need to hear the gospel? Well, of course the gospel needs to be proclaimed. We're supposed to take it out of the highways and hedges and proclaim it to every creature. But the reality is, and while there is a sense in which preaching the gospel can be beneficial to Christians as well, the reality is the church, although we welcome anybody that wants to come in our doors, whether they're saved or not, and we will try to lead them to Jesus Christ if they come in unsaved, the gathering of the church is for Christians. We already have heard the gospel. That's what saved us. Now we need to hear, what is your expectation for us? How do you want to transform us? How do you want to change us? And so the pastor gets up and he preaches the doctrines of the New Testament scriptures and he even brings into the Old Testament scriptures and their application to the New Testament church that we may understand what Jesus saved us for and what he intends for us to be and what he has for us to do that we might come together as a body and be built up in our most holy faith be equipped to go and do the work, not only among our church family, but even being equipped to take the gospel to the unsaved in our community and around the world. This is the work that Paul is saying is, is important that God has called us to do, that he's even sent gifts to do this. So if a church is anchored but not advancing, they're not really being a, a New Testament church. For while the church must be established on Jesus Christ alone to be a church, she must also be growing. She must be being built up in her most holy faith. And without this happening, she stagnates, and she fails to fulfill her God-given potential. And so a church must be anchored. A church must be advancing. And thirdly and lastly, I would say this this morning, a church, true church must be advancing appropriately. It must be advancing appropriately. Let's go back to our text, verse 12. Paul says, For if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If a man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You know, Paul's warning here is obviously to those who were presently leading the church in Corinth or those who were in their assembly that desired to be leaders. His warning to them is this, there's coming a day, he says. There's coming a day when God will judge the building efforts of all of these ministers. And he's going to judge it by sending, I guess, what we might call a refining fire upon them to test their work. And he says what is able to come through that refining fire, when the fire comes upon them, what it remains, what is lasting, will be that minister's reward. What fails to come through the fire, what gets disintegrated by the fire, is his loss. And whereas he says he'll be saved so as by fire, it doesn't take away his salvation if he's truly a child of God. He has absolutely nothing to show for his life. Nothing with which to glorify God in the eternity to come. Now Paul warns that this building, he said, can be done in two different ways. The building can be done using gold, silver, precious stones. 
Or he says the building can be done using wood, hay, stubble. And Paul himself doesn't elaborate upon these building materials or even seemingly distinguish between the three materials in each of the two categories. So I'm not going to take time to try to do that this morning. It would be fruitless because he doesn't say. But his point seems to be that there are building materials that will be able to withstand Christ's coming judgment, and there are other building materials that will not. How sad is it that there are churches which were founded on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, but through the course of their earthly history, the building efforts, the building material used, were found to be inconsistent with the foundational material upon which they had been erected. Some have su suffered the result of inferior building materials and have deteriorated over the years to the point that you cannot even recognize them as the New Testament church anymore. I'm sure it's here in Missouri too, but living in New England for all those years, you can drive on the old country highways and you will see building after building after building after building after building after building that at one time was a church, <laughs> a group of believers who were meeting and seeking to glorify God and fulfill his purposes, and now they're either completely gone the building's being used for some other purpose. Or the congregations that's there, if you walked in on a Sunday morning to see what they were doing, you wouldn't even recognize anything Christian about what's happening there. That's sad. And it's frightening. But if can I say this, perhaps even more frightening, is the way Paul teaches this is, is the fact that he seems to indicate there could be churches which would appear from man's eyes to be thriving and flourishing. One, from our vantage point, if we're thinking about it through, certainly through just human eyes, the edifice seems to be magnificent. But which will, during this coming day of judgment that Jesus is going to bring upon all of these works, when his consuming refining fire comes, Paul seems to indicate, will leave absolutely nothing behind. The only thing that will remain is the foundation, Jesus Christ. Everything that was built upon it is going to be consumed and evaporated because it was made out of inferior building materials. It was wood, hay, and stubble. This is obviously a warning for church leaders. It sobers me, i got to tell you that. And it better sober any individual who would dare to say that they're going to be used of God to help build one of Christ's churches upon the foundation that has been laid. But it really should sober every church member as well. For Abundant Life Baptist Church to remain consistent with her most holy calling, then she must be a church that ensures that she is anchored, that she is firmly established on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. Folks, if we ever lose sight of what the church is, we are the bride of Christ, that we exist because of nothing that we are, but because of everything that God has done for us through Jesus Christ. That we are here because God, by His grace, has brought us to a point of repentance. We have turned from our sins. We have put our faith in Jesus Christ. We have now been new creatures in Him. And He has established His church here. If we ever lose sight of the foundation, we're done. We don't have a church anymore. I don't care what we call ourselves or how many people come in the doors. A church is a church because it's on the foundation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We need to always keep that in our minds. But we also must be evaluating ourselves in this way, too. Are we advancing? Are we a church that is growing in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and his purposes for our lives? And are we a church who is being equipped to serve him in this area of our most holy faith? How sad would it be that there could be groups of people that get together every Sunday and never once are we challenged Never once am I ever brought to bear with my own life and my futility in it as a Christian. My many failings to serve the Lord and to glorify Him with my life. That I would be allowed to be comfortable to come in week after week after week and go out those doors no different than the way I walked in. To make us think that somehow I am all that God wants me to be. No, we're not. Abundant Life Baptist Church is not all that God wants it to be unless it's growing, thriving. And I'm not talking about numbers, although that's great and wonderful too. I'm talking about us growing. That our understanding of His truth is continuing to grow. That we're being more firmly anchored in His truth, better equipped to serve Him, more valuable to Him in His service, not only within our local church, but in the world around us. That's what I mean by advancing. That's what Paul is saying. This is that building that goes on in the foundation. What kind of edifice is being built? What kind of church are we? We must be a church that's advancing appropriately. We must be constantly evaluating the worth 
and the validity of the building materials that are being used. So that we can be assured to not only survive Christ's refining fire, but that in the day of his judgment we will come forth as gold. Can I say this, and I mean this with all honesty? There are people throughout my ministry who have come to me and said, Pastor, I'm not so sure about what you're saying here. I'm not so sure about what you're teaching here. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. I have never shied away from that. I've learned from that. I am bettered by that. I'm your shepherd, yes, but I'm not the source of all knowledge. Hold me accountable. Challenge me in my thinkings. Bring me to the scriptures and ask me, well, what about this? What about this? That's good. Let's do that. I welcome that. But let me say this on the flip side, dear church. Do you welcome a pastor who stands up and challenges your thinking? A challenge who says, hey, is that really what God said? I know that's what we've thought all these years, but is that what God said? And it would challenge us to say, we should not be more concerned about what other people think of what we believe. We should be most concerned about what Jesus thinks about what we believe. This mutual giving and taking, this mutual respect, this mutual ministry is what assures that our church is anchored, advancing, and always advancing appropriately. It's needful, folks. This is what brings us together as a body. It ought to be all of our visions, our, our purpose, our desire. It ought to be what drives us as a church. So I'm doing this series in Ephesians on Sunday mornings, call, calling upon us to think about what is said about the church, because the church is important. It's really important. It's eternally important. If the Lord tarries, for another 20 years. Where will Abundant Life Baptist Church be in 2039? Will she even still exist? It's a fair question given our day and age. Will she be a church if she still exists that remains anchored to her foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ? Will this be a church that will forever, their testimony will be Jesus Christ and Him crucified? There is no one else but Jesus Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of these earth, these things will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That he will be the focus, the preeminent one in everything that we think about as a church. Will we be that way in 2039 if the Lord tarries? And will we be a church if somebody's alive still that can come back and examine us now and examine us then? Will we be a church who has been built up and is continuing to be built up in her holy, most holy faith, knowing Living under the reality that there's coming a day where Jesus Christ is going to judge us as a church. His refining fire is going to come down and cascade upon us. And what we have been built with is going to determine what lasts, what remains. You know the answer to that question? What will be in 2039 if the Lord tarries? The answer to that question lies with us all lies with us all. Not just this guy, although I have an important responsibility at this time that I'm your pastor, but it lies with us all. May God help us. May God help Abundant Life Baptist Church to be anchored and advancing. Father, I pray you challenge us with these thoughts this morning. Father, I pray that we would see what your apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was challenging this local church with in this text. Father, may we see what message it has for us today. Oh, Father, may we as a congregation be excited, excited about your purposes here. I don't know why you loved us. I don't know why you sent your son to die for us. But you do, and you did. And at least the members of this church, by their own testimony, came to an understanding of that, and they turned from their sin. And they put their trust in Jesus Christ. And now they're one of your children. And at least for the time being, you've placed them within this body. And we're here in this place for this time. This church has been here 20 years. And we look back on our past. We want to learn from it. We want to be blessed from it. We want to be encouraged by it. But there is a real sense in which whatever has gone on in the past, in one sense, doesn't matter. We're the church today. What are we? What will we be? 
What will we remain? What will you be able to do through us? Father, challenge us this morning with these thoughts and with the possibilities that are wrapped up in them. And may we as a church be one which takes seriously and is is encouraged and invigorated by the fact that we need to be a church that is anchored and advancing. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.